Sylvia May Quayle lived in Cherry Hills Village, Colorado in 1981. She worked as a personal assistant at an architecture company. Sylvia was also great at cooking and had opened her own business specializing in wedding cakes. She was described as ambitious, vibrant and friendly. Every morning, Sylvia would go to her parents' house to have coffee with them. At 11 p.m. on August 3rd, 1981, Sylvia spoke to her sister on the phone. That would be the last time anyone spoke to her. The next morning, Sylvia's father, William Quayle, arrived at her apartment. William made his way inside and made a gruesome discovery. He found his daughter's lifeless body on a living room floor. She had been assaulted and strangled. Sylvia had a few broken fingernails, indicating that she had fought for her life. Investigators determined that the attacker tried several windows in order to gain access. He also cut the exterior phone line to make sure that Sylvia was unable to call the police for help. 140 pieces of evidence were collected from the crime scene, including DNA left behind by the attacker. Not long after the crime, Otis Elwood Toole confessed to the crime. His confession was false, however. Otis and his companion, Henry Lee Lucas, claimed hundreds of victims, but investigators have only been able to confirm a handful. In 1995, the DNA from the attacker was entered in the Dakota's database, but no matches were made. In 2019, investigators worked with United Data Connect, they specialize in genetic genealogy. In May 2020, the company's technicians had a name, David Dwayne Anderson. Anderson was just 22 years old at the time of the crime and lived just a couple of miles away from Sylvia. Investigators traveled to Cozad, Nebraska, where David now lives. They tried to secretly collect his DNA. Investigators found 15 items in his trash bag that could potentially have DNA on it. They were able to retrieve a clear DNA profile from a vanilla cocaine. On January 29, 2021, the Colorado Bureau of Investigation were informed that DNA testing confirmed that David's DNA matched the DNA at a crime scene. David was subsequently arrested at his home in Nebraska. David is currently in the Dawson County Jail in Nebraska. If convicted, David faces life in prison. Gail Barris was born in San Antonio, Texas in 1958, but grew up in Battle Creek, Michigan after moving there as a child. Gail had training as a nursing assistant, but despite this, she found herself working two jobs at local bars in the Battle Creek area in 1988. Gail was last seen on October 9, leaving Speed's coffee shop on West Michigan Avenue in Battle Creek. Witnesses say Gail was arguing with a dark-haired man. After she was last seen, she failed to turn up for either of her jobs. This was completely out of character for her. Her family could also not reach her. Just over two weeks later, on October 25th, Gail's body was found in Emmett Township, Michigan, just about five miles from where she was last seen. She had been assaulted and stabbed. Gail left behind her children, aged 10, 12 and 13. 24-year-old Roger Plato quickly became a suspect in the case. He lived in the area and was investigated for a different assault case. When investigators tried to question him, a fight broke out and ended with Roger being fatally shot. His family maintained his innocence and said that he was very respectful of women, so they did not believe it was him. Investigators talked to Roger's friends, hoping they knew something, but no more information came to light. The case was closed and would remain that way for decades. In 2021, one of the detectives came across a DNA sample that was collected from Roger. After DNA testing, it was confirmed that Roger was the one that assaulted Gail and took her life. 
Gail's son, James Barris, admitted in a Facebook post about her update that he had not been the easiest person to deal with over the years when it came to investigators working the case. But he extended his gratitude to Sergeant Marshall of the Michigan State Police. In 2007, an unknown man in a grey Chevrolet pickup truck hit a man on a motorcycle in Midland, Texas and left the scene without helping the man. There was nothing the paramedics could do. The man passed away due to his injuries. He was identified as 27-year-old Dustin Davidson. Investigators tried to identify the person who drove in a Chevrolet pickup truck, but they were unable to. No one came forward with useful information, and a case went cold. It would stay that way until 2021. In February, the Midland Police Department received a tip that a man in the pickup truck was Raymond Dale Click. Investigators went to talk to him and he confessed. He said that he was too scared to come forward in 2007. Raymond could be facing up to 20 years in prison. Midland Police Officer Kevin Haveman said it is probably one of the most rewarding cases, one of the most rewarding calls I've been able to make. The parents expressed their gratitude, first of all, and they said that they thought this is a case that I would never get solved, and they would never get answers to. 59-year-old Virginia Hannon lived in Boston, Massachusetts in 1984. She used to be a lunch lady at a local elementary school, but retired when she was left some family inheritance. Virginia was also a widow and lived alone in her home. On February 12, 1984, someone broke into her house, then stabbed and strangled her. Her body was found on her bed. The motive for what happened was not clear. Investigators were not able to find the person who took Virginia's life, and the case went cold. In 2020, a man came forward with information that would finally help solve the case. He told investigators that he had a friend named Jesse Aylward. In 2019, Jesse told him that he took the life of Virginia Hannon. The reason he only told investigators in 2020 is because Jesse passed away just a day before at the age of 58. Investigators got a DNA sample from Jesse's body at a hospital where he had just passed away. In 2021, they learned that it matched the DNA found on several items that were at a crime scene. Jesse was never someone investigators looked into, but he did live close to Virginia, and he does apparently have a criminal past. District Attorney Tim Cruz, not to be confused with the Zodiac Ted Cruz, had this to say at a news conference. No one in this room ever gave up on finding out who committed this heinous crime. Without a DNA, we would not know who did it. Most of Virginia's family members were on hand for the announcement, and they were thankful the day had finally come. It is still not known why JC did what he did, as nothing was taken and it is not believed that he knew Virginia. Tim Cruz said, you know, DNA gets us to the people, but it does not necessarily get us to what exactly happened. Virginia's nephew, Richard Hannon said, she was a great woman, she was very family oriented and loved the area, loved the people around here and was very generous. He still hopes that someone who knew Jesse would come forward with more information. Somebody will remember I believe, somebody will be brave enough to come forward. On September 18, 2001, a seven-year-old girl and her eight-year-old brother were walking to school in Greeley, Colorado. A man who was sitting near an alley got out and forced the little girl into his car. He then drove to a secluded area near the Greeley airport where he assaulted her. She managed to get away and went to the Air National Guard near the airport where police were called. The victim described the man as being light-skinned. She believed he might have been around 25 years old. 
he had a bad complexion and possibly a tattoo of a snake on one arm. He also spoke a little Spanish. Investigators tried to identify the man, but were unable to and the case went cold for many years. In August of 2019, investigators contacted Parabon Nanolabs in Virginia to request the company's Snapshot DNA phenotyping service. The snapshot produced an image showing what a subject potentially looked like. They can predict his ancestry, eye color, hair color, skin color, and face shape. This is what they came up with. Parabon Nanolabs also used genetic genealogy to help find a man. Finally, in 2021, they identified the man as James Zamora. He was 26 years old at the time of the crime. This is a picture of what he looked like in 2001. He passed away in 2012, so sadly, there will not be any justice for the little girl. Investigators believe that James might be involved in more cold cases. They are asking anyone who knew him or had any interactions with him to please contact Detective Robert Cash at this number. On December 20th, 1976, three suitcases were found close to the Lehigh River in Whitehaven, Pennsylvania along Interstate 80. Inside the suitcases were the remains of a young woman. Investigators determined that she had been assaulted and strangled. Sadly, they also discovered that the woman was nine months pregnant. Her unborn daughter did not make it. It is believed that the suitcases had been thrown out of a vehicle traveling west. Two of the suitcases landed in the woods and the other one landed on the riverbank. It is likely that the perpetrator wanted to throw it in the river to lessen the chance of it being found. The young woman was given the name Beth Doe. She was roughly 5 feet tall and weighed 145 pounds due to her pregnancy. Beth Doe had dark brown hair and it was believed that she was white and born in Europe before moving to the United States. Her fingerprints were taken, her teeth were examined, and missing persons reports throughout the United States and Canada were compared, but she still could not be identified. In 2015, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children released two reconstructions. In September 2019, the Pennsylvania State Police announced that Beth Doe could potentially be Madeline Cruz. Madeline Cruz ran away from her family in 1974. In 1976, she called a friend asking for money because she was pregnant. Madeline would fit the timelines and description, but investigators found her alive and well. The renewed interest in the case, however, led police to use familial DNA of Beth Doe. They used DNA to locate some of her family members. On March 31, 2021, Beth Doe's identity was revealed as Evelyn Cologne. She was 15 years old and of Puerto Rican origin. In 1976, she lived with 19-year-old Luis Sierra in Jersey City. One day, Evelyn contacted her mother asking for soup, but when she got there, Evelyn was gone. Luis sent her family a letter telling them that she had given birth to a child and not to worry. She would contact them if she needed anything. Evelyn's family never reported her missing as they believed she was safe with Luis and that she had cut contact deliberately. Also, on March 31, 2021, investigators went to Luis's home and questioned him. He at first claimed he had no idea who Evelyn Colon was, but later changed his story. Investigators felt they had enough to arrest him and did just that. He is currently being held without bail. Kristen Denise Smart was born on February 20, 1977 in Augsburg, Germany. She and her family moved to Stockton, California when she was a child. In 1996, Kristen enrolled at a California Polytechnic State University. On May 25th, she attended a party at a frat house. At approximately 2 a.m., she was found passed out on a neighbor's lawn by two fellow students, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis. They helped Kristen to her feet and decided to walk her back to her nearby dorm. Another student, Paul Flores, joined the group and offered to help get Kristen there safely. After a while of walking, Tim Davis left since he lived off campus. Thereafter, 
Anderson left and told Flores to get Kristen to her dorm as he lived closest to her. That would be the last time Kristen was ever seen alive. She was reported missing to the university police department. They believed Kristen went on an unannounced vacation, but when she did not return, the investigation started. Paul Flores was questioned. He said that after he and Kristen reached his dorm, he left her to walk back to her dorm on her own. Investigators have always seen Paul Flores as the main suspect. Between 1996 and 2007, investigators have conducted numerous searches at houses belonging to the Flores family. An earring that potentially belonged to Kristen was found by a tenant at a former residence of Paul Flores' mom. In September 2016, investigators excavated an area on the campus. They did find a few items that they decided to analyze. No more information on those items have been made public. In 2021, investigators started searching at Paul Flores' home once again. They used ground penetrating radar and dogs. Numerous items of interest were found. This included a car belonging to Paul Flores' father, Ruben Flores. On April 13, 2021, Paul Flores and Ruben Flores were arrested by the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office in relation to the case. Paul Flores is being held without bail and his 80-year-old father on a $250,000 bail. San Luis Obispo County Sheriff Ian Parkinson said that he could not reveal what new evidence led to the break in the case. He also said that he is confident that they will find Kristen's remains. Kristen's parents made a statement after hearing about the news. It is impossible to put into words what this day means for our family. We pray it is the first step to bringing our daughter home. While Kristen's loving spirit will always live in our hearts, our life without her hugs, laughs and smiles is a heartache that never goes away. The knowledge that a father and son, despite our desperate pleas for help, could have withheld this horrible secret for nearly 25 years, denying us the chance to allow our daughter to rest, is an unrelenting and unforgiving pain. We now put our faith in a justice system and move forward, comforted in the knowledge that Kristen has been held in the hearts of so many and that she has not been forgotten. We are pleased that Kristen's case has now moved to the district attorney's office, where we know we will be in good hands and look forward to the day when there will be justice for Kristen. To heal, we must remember not only Kristen, but also every heart had carried Kristen and our family in theirs. Kristen's story is ultimately one of unwavering commitment, resilience and immense gratitude. 22-year-old Zachary Marshall lived in Bristol County, Massachusetts in 2010. He had a newborn daughter. Zachary worked at his uncle's auto body shop. At 2 a.m. on December 18, 2010, Zachary and a friend of his were walking from a nightclub in Providence, Rhode Island. An argument broke out between Zachary and a group of men and a woman. During the argument, he was stabbed. Zachary passed away at a Rhode Island hospital. Every year his family would raise money for a scholarship in his name and a fund for his daughter. They would talk to everyone in the area, seeking information on the case. In 2021, they would finally find the answers they were looking for. In March of 2021, Jason Lopez was arrested in Garland, Texas in connection with the case. He is currently being held without bail at a Dallas County Jail in Texas and awaiting extradition back to Rhode Island. Detective Angelo Avant uncovered new evidence in the case that was brought to the Attorney General's office and led to the arrest. He did not want to specify what the evidence was. Attorney General Peter Nerona said, the indictment in this case is a major step forward in our efforts to obtain justice for Mr. Marshall and his family. Ten years is a long time 
and I recognize how difficult it has been for the family of Mr. Marshall to wait for this day to come. There is a distance on the road to justice, still to travel, but I am pleased that we have reached this point. Zachary's mother, Diane Marshall, said that the news of the arrest brought a lot of emotion and pain. We are extremely grateful to the Providence Police Department and all the hard work and tireless hours they have put into our son Zach's case. We are grateful for our family and the community support that we have received over the last 10 years. 21-year-old April Annette De Boy lived in Greenville County, South Carolina. She was married to David Randall De Boy. Their marriage was not a happy one and they got legally separated. On February 19, 2001, Greenville County police officers were called to the apartment April had been living in, in Hudson Road, because she had not been seen in over a week. Inside of the apartment, April's body was found. Investigators determined that she passed away due to suspicious circumstances nine days earlier. They believed that David took her life and he was arrested in 2006. There was, however, not enough evidence against him and he was let go. A close friend of April, Brandy Jones, described April like this. On the outside, she was sassy and spunky and a life of the party, always smiling. But once she was by herself, she was scared, she was broken. On March 18, 2021, 55-year-old David was arrested again in connection to the case. Lieutenant Ryan Flatt said, This past year, the Sheriff Office New Cold Case Unit revisited the case and initiated their own investigation where they established probable cause using newly discovered evidence which determined David the boy was responsible for taking the life of his then legally separated wife. David is currently held in a Greenville County Detention Center on no bond. Sheriff Hobart Lewis released the statement on the arrest. While I cannot fathom the hardship that families face when they tragically lose a loved one and the case goes unsolved, I can express that our office is doing everything in our power to revisit each and every one of these cold cases in hopes of bringing eventual justice to these families. I am very proud of the work our investigators have been putting into these cold cases and it is my hope to provide even a trace of closure to everyone who has been affected by these tragic circumstances. It has not yet been made public specifically what new evidence led to the arrest. 40-year-old Kara Enid Vaughn lived in Natchitoches, Louisiana in 1993. Her sister Lynn used to be the headline news anchor for CNN. In November, Kara left home in a white 1978 Honda Civic with less than $10 on her person. When she did not make it back home, her family got worried and they reported her missing. They told investigators they were worried because Kara often told them that she was going to drive a car into a river where she would not be found. Some of her friends believed that she may have moved to California. It seemed unlikely, however, as she only took the $10 with her. Kara was a diabetic and was not taking her medication. A search for her was conducted to no avail. In 2007, dive teams searched Cane River Lake after they learned that this was a river mentioned by Kara. Divers were unable to locate Kara or a vehicle, however. Then in March of 2021, fishermen called the police to tell them that they believe they found a car in the Cane River Lake. On March 15, divers found a Honda Civic. Inside was a woman's remains. They also found documents and an ID belonging to Kara. On March 24, it was confirmed that her remains belonged to Kara Vaughan. Her family has been notified of the discovery. This is not the news they would have liked to hear, as they always had hoped that she was still alive. The news also sadly came too late as Kara's parents passed away and never learned what happened to their daughter.
she left on November 3rd, 1993. I won't ever forget that date. The day 40-year-old Caravan vanished without a trace from Natchitoches, Louisiana, 27 long years ago. Yesterday, her sister Lynn got a call from an unknown number. It was Sheriff Wright, um, the Natchitoches Parish Sheriff. And he said, Lynn, um, I hate to tell you like this, he said, but I think we found Kara. 29-year-old Gary Watson lived in Johnson County, Kansas. He had a wife and children. In March of 1985, Gary was heading home. When he got to his doorway, an unknown man snuck up on him and stabbed him several times. The man then went into Gary's apartment and stole some items. Gary sadly did not survive the stabbing. Investigators collected DNA evidence from inside the apartment and kept it to be used later. Investigators had some suspects, but they were never able to prove that any of these men committed a crime. Gary's sister, Audrey Walker, always made sure that investigators never forgot Gary Watson's case. In 2021, with advances in DNA and a new set of eyes on the case, investigators finally found their man. In April 2021, 65-year-old Kira Rimes was arrested in connection to the case in St. Louis, Missouri. Kate Meyer, who is a crime scene investigator for the Johnson County Sheriff's Office, said that forensic evidence collected at a crime scene back in 1985 was tested again in 2020 and then led to the arrest in 2021. Due to the quality of the original scene processing and subsequent evidence storage, it was possible for additional analysis to be performed and actionable results to be obtained all these years later. Gary's sister Audrey said that when she heard the news, the tears just started flowing. It was just an overwhelming sense of thank you God. There's some closure, like true healing can begin. She also said that Gary was a loving, caring and compassionate spirit for other people. Audrey said that her family never gave up hope. I understood that from 1985 to 2021, there have been so many new processes in place for the criminal justice system that you cannot just walk away from what you did even if it took so many years. Angela Christine Mack was born on March 16, 1982 in Escondido, California. Just after middle school, her family relocated to Salem, Arkansas in Fulton County. Their home was set in farming country in the foothills of the Ozarks. Angela was described as outgoing and fun. She quickly made a close circle of female friends. A friend of hers by the name of Tiffany Thomas described her. She was short and spunky, outgoing and dramatic, loud but so much fun. She was always trying to make people laugh, pulling a prank or playing a joke on someone. In 1998, 16-year-old Angela had a son named Michael with her husband, Tommy Redhue. The marriage did not work out, so Tommy and Angela got divorced. In 2000, Angela had another son, Matt, with Jeremy Niederbrack. This relationship was also short-lived. In 2002, Angela married James Cox. They lived in Salem, Arkansas. On May 29, 2002, Angela and James were involved in a head-on two-car fatality crash on State Highway 9 in Fulton County. Angela and James sustained serious injuries, but survived. The driver of the other vehicle, Susan Maines, passed away the next day in a Missouri hospital. The passenger, Lacey Maines, lost her unborn child. A lot of information about what happened after the accident is unknown. We do know that on September 1st, 2002, Michael Retu was reported missing by his father. Michael was last seen with Angela, who was also missing. Strangely enough, Angela was only reported missing in 2004 by her mom two years later. It is not known 
why her husband at the time, James Cox, or anyone else did not report her missing earlier. It honestly appears as if investigators only bothered looking into the two disappearances in 2020. It was then that a new investigator, Dale Weaver, came out of retirement to look for leads in the cold case. He decided to make a timeline of the disappearances and also interview family and friends of Angela. After some investigating, Dale found that James and Angela went to hospital after the car crash. James's brother Jeremy Cox went to pick up Angela and her son Michael from the hospital in Missouri. Jeremy was arrested for being in possession of a stolen vehicle. This left Michael and Angela stuck in Missouri. The two of them made their way to a farm owned by Clarence and Barbara Cruson. In October 2020, Dale Weaver contacted Barbara. She said that she remembered meeting Angela and Michael. Barbara claims that she and her husband, Clarence, signed papers to adopt Michael and that Angela went to California. After a few weeks, Angela changed her mind and wanted to stop the adoption. She then made her way back to the Cruisons farm in Missouri to pick up Michael. Barbara said that the last time she saw Angela and Michael was on September 1, 2002. In April 2021, investigators got Barbara to do a polygraph test. She failed. After the test, Barbara decided to confess. She told them that her husband Clarence took the lives of Angela and Michael. He then got rid of the evidence by burning their bodies in a furnace. Investigators could not question him as his life was taken in 2012. Investigators believe Barbara and now sees this case as solved. There are however still a lot of questions. Her family still does not know where her remains are. It also does not make sense to me how her husband did not report her missing after he was released from the hospital. The motive for the crime seems to be that Clarence was greatly angered by Angela changing her mind regarding the adoption. 22-year-old Lloyd Perkins lived in Seaside, California in 1995. On September 21st, Lloyd was fatally shot by an unknown man on Amador Avenue in Seaside. The Seaside Police Department worked their case aggressively in the 1990s and a lot of information came in, but there was never enough to pin down the suspect. In the early 2000s, the case was looked into again. Detectives made a little bit more headway and started to pin down people who were in the area at the time of the crime. In 2010, Seaside Deputy Police Chief Nick Bores was working on a different case. During his investigation, he met Lloyd Perkins' mom, Gloria. She told him that her son's case is still unsolved. He promised her that he would not forget and he would do everything in his power to make sure the case gets solved. Recently, the Seaside Police Department joined the newly created Monterey County Cold Case Task Force. In April 2021, 49-year-old Anthony Randall was booked into the Monterey County Jail in connection to the case. Nick Boris said that people involved in the case got older and they were more willing to talk and share what they know. The current detectives followed up on some leads and they were able to identify several additional witnesses and get more information at really locking the suspect had I arrested. Some of these people had been interviewed in the past and things didn't go very far, so they really did some good follow-up on it and were able to corroborate what some of these witnesses were saying and we are very confident that Mr. Randall is responsible for taking the life of Lloyd Perkins in 1995. Nick Boris lived up to his promise. He was able to tell Lloyd's mom the good news that an arrest has been made. Fifteen-year-old Lori Nesson lived in Columbus, Ohio in 1974. She attended Eastmoor High School. Nesson performed well in school, becoming an honor student during her academic career. On September 27, 1974, she attended a high school football game. After the game was over, 
she went to a house party. Just after midnight, she started walking home. Lori Nissen would sadly never make it home. The next day, her body was found on the west side of Reynoldsburg, Ohio, in a ditch. Her clothes were scattered across several miles. An autopsy was done and it was determined that she passed away due to asphyxia of undetermined origin. This meant that investigators did not believe someone took her life. The family pleaded with investigators to reopen the case and they finally did in 2019. A new coroner decided to review the case. He determined as someone definitely took Lori Nesson's life. In December 2020, 10TV aired a broadcast on the Lori Nesson case. That night, a viewer called Reynoldsburg police with information that could finally solve the case. The woman said what happened to Lori was very similar to what happened to her cousin, Karen Adams. In March of 1975, 17-year-old Karen Adams left her home in Whitehall, Ohio. She told her parents as she was going to a girlfriend's house to pick up some clothes she had left there, but she actually planned to meet up with her boyfriend at a supermarket. Karen's body was found the next day in a ditch about six miles from her home. She had been assaulted and strangled. There are a lot of similarities between the two cases. Both Karen and Lori were teenagers, found in a ditch and passed away within a few months of one another. Karen's case was solved however. In 2011, Robert Meyer was arrested in connection to her case and convicted in 2012 as his DNA was found at a crime scene. Meyer passed away just a few years after being imprisoned. There were DNA samples from two different men found at Karen's crime scene, but investigators were unable to identify the second man. Karen's cousin believed that Meyer could be responsible for what happened to Lori Nesson as well, and that is why she called investigators. In 2021, DNA testing was done to see if Meyer was indeed responsible for taking the life of Lori. It was discovered that there were also DNA from two men found at Lori's crime scene. One of the DNA samples matched the DNA of Robert Meyer. Investigators believed that the other DNA sample could potentially belong to Charles Weber. He was a friend of Meyer and they both served time together in prison. Weber passed away in 1992 and he was cremated. Investigators had to get a DNA sample from Weber's son. It was then confirmed that Robert Meyer and Charles Weber took the life of Lori Nesson. It was also discovered that a second man involved in taking the life of Karen Adams was in fact Charles Weber. Investigators believe that these two men committed more crimes and are currently investigating it. Detective Chuck Clark from the Franklin County Sheriff's Office had this to say, I always had a feeling these two guys were responsible for more and what they were caught for. They would drink, drive around the city, wherever, and they would approach girls and young women that were by themselves. When this happened in 1974, this didn't just happen to me and my mom. This totally changed everything for all of us. When they told me they got hits and that they knew who did it, um, for the like the next five minutes, I, I really don't remember anything. I really hope that this opens the doors for other cases, for other families that have no answers. Nobody, nobody should ever have to wait 46 years. What she must have gone through that night, there's no way to know. Twenty-nine-year-old Evelyn Day lived in Weld County, Colorado in 1979. She worked at Ames Community College. Evelyn was last seen on the night of November 26, 1979, when she was locking up her office. The next morning, her husband Stanley realized she never returned home, and he filed a missing persons report. Later that day, Evelyn's body was found in a vehicle parked on the side of the road, close to her office, 
by two of her co-workers. She had been assaulted and strangled using a belt from the coat that she had been wearing. Investigators collected DNA from her body and questioned men they believed could have been involved, but the case went cold. In May of 2020, Evelyn's case was reopened by Weld County Sheriff's Office Detective Byron Castellan. He asked that the DNA evidence found at a crime scene be submitted in the National Combined DNA Index System so that it could be compared to millions of profiles. On August 26, 2020, Byron received a call notifying him that the DNA found at a crime scene matched the DNA of James Herman Dye. James was a convicted felon with a long criminal history in Kansas and Colorado. In October 2020, Byron submitted an order to Ames Community College to produce records of student and employee rosters. He found that James was enrolled in classes in the summer and fall of 1979, the winter of 1980, and the summer of 1982. While reviewing case files, Byron also found that there was a Crime Stoppers tip in September 1988. According to the tip, James arrived home with blood all over his clothes on the night of the crime. He also knew a woman's life was taken before it made the news. No follow-up was ever made on the tip. After asking for more records, Byron found that James was enrolled in a steering and suspension system class very close to Evelyn's office. James's behavior and attendance changed in the days and weeks after the crime took place. Byron Castellan also interviewed family members of James. They all believed he was capable of committing the crime. In March of 2021, James was arrested. He denied knowing Evelyn, making physical contact with her or taking her life. He also said that he did not remember specifically what he was doing on November 26 and 27 of 1979, as it was so long ago. He is currently incarcerated at a Sedgwick County Jail in Kansas and will be taken to Colorado soon to stand trial. Seventy-nine-year-old Viola Hackencourt lived alone in an apartment in Anaheim, California in 1980. On February 18, 1980, a neighbor of Viola became concerned about her whereabouts. Viola was often seen walking around the apartment complex, but she hadn't been seen for two days. The neighbor stepped inside Viola's unit and found her lifeless body. She had been assaulted and strangled. Over the years, detectives attempted to solve the case, pursuing new leads or bits of evidence, but failed to identify a suspect, and the case went cold. In September of 2020, the case was reopened. This time, investigators turned to genetic testing technology, which has been used to solve dozens of cold cases across the US. Investigators used DNA found on Viola and compared it with genetic profiles on genealogy databases. This led investigators to 64-year-old Andre William Lepere. He was arrested on April 28, 2021 at his home in Alamogordo, New Mexico in connection to the case. He is being held without bail at an Otero County Jail. It is not believed that Andre and Viola knew each other. Viola's family had to say in a statement our grandmother was a beautiful, happy soul and did not deserve being violated in her final years of life. We are so grateful for the Anaheim Police Department never giving up after 41 years. My sister was relentless and never gave up pursuing this. And that is our message, never, never give up. Andre was in his 20s at the time of the crime and lived close to Viola in Anaheim, California. Sometime in the 1990s, he moved east. He spread his time between Arizona and New Mexico. Andre worked as a plumber and a truck driver. He married twice and had two children. Investigators have not yet established a motive for the crime. Not much is known about his next case. 
64-year-old Louis Massa lived in Orange County, Florida. In December 2016, his body was found in front of his car on his driveway in Terrell Road. He passed away due to blunt force trauma. Someone had hit him over the head using a large lawn ornament. Some of his rings and phone had been stolen. There was also a broken window in his house. This made investigators believe had Lewis interrupted the burglary. Neighbors told investigators had a man jumped the fence after triggering the house alarm just before police arrived on the scene. Witnesses helped investigators create the composite sketch. Investigators also found that another burglary took place less than a mile from Lewis's home a few days before his life was taken. Fingerprints were collected at a crime scene. Recently, these fingerprints were tested to see if it matches anyone in a CODIS database. This led investigators to Devon Hill. When questioned, he admitted that he took Lewis's life. He was arrested on January 29, 2021. He is currently being held in the Orange County Jail without bond. Christopher James Bush lived in Waikato, New Zealand in 1987. He had a wife and two daughters. Christopher owned a Red Fox Tavern. On the evening of October 24, 1987, he found himself in his office busy counting the money they made that night. A few of his staff members were busy closing up. Just after 11 pm, two heavily disguised men came running into the tavern. One of them had a shotgun and the other one a bat. Christopher tossed the glass at the head of one of the attackers, but he missed and hit a framed photo behind him. Christopher was then fatally shot. The two attackers made off with almost $40,000. Investigators were quickly on the scene. They collected some pieces of evidence that they believed could be useful later. Over 200 persons of interest were identified by investigators from witnesses. Most of them were ruled out as they had alibis. On Christmas Eve 1987, a man by the name of Philip Dunbier came forward telling investigators he knew who committed the crime. He agreed to wear a wire and go talk to one of the attackers. In a conversation he had, the one attacker admitted he was involved in the robbery. Investigators, however, did not believe it was enough to make an arrest at the time. They did question the two men that could potentially be the attackers. One of them is Michael Hoggart, and the other one has not been named yet. The unnamed man had just been released for an armed robbery a few days before Christopher's life was taken. Michael was also no stranger to committing such crimes. Over the years, investigators found more evidence against these two men. They had a lot more money to spend directly after the crime, and they were also seen near the tavern. The unnamed man also had the same shotgun that was used, and he tried to get rid of it shortly after the crime. In 2021, investigators believed they had enough evidence, and the case went to trial in February. In March of 2021, Michael and an unnamed man were found guilty of taking the life of Christopher. 34-year-old Krista Lueff lived in Lansing, Michigan in 2008. She had recently broken up with her boyfriend, Brad Cornea. Krista went to Michigan State University to get a second degree. On November 11, 2008, Krista finished her classes, then took the bus home to a rented house on Eureka Street. Since she broke up with her boyfriend and he moved out, Krista was worried about making ends meet. Krista talked to one of her friends just after 5 pm. That would be the last time she was seen or heard from. She was supposed to attend a class at a greenhouse half a mile from her home just after 6 pm, but she never showed up. Her friends tried calling her, but she did not pick up. They then entered her home. Inside they found her beloved cat alone. It also appeared as if she had been interrupted while cooking. Krista was nowhere to be seen. 
Brad Cornea quickly became a person of interest in the case, but he denied any involvement. He also had an alibi. On the evening of November 11, his truck broke down near College Road, about 8 miles from Krista's home. A police officer offered to help him, but Brad said that a tow truck was on the way, so the police officer left. Krista's father Roy went to the police station every day to ask if there was any more information, and to make sure they do not forget the case. A few months later while searching for Krista, investigators found Krista's driver license, debit card and her broken cell phone near College Road, exactly where Brad's truck had broken down. Investigators also found that Brad had lied to them. He said that he was not in the area of Krista's home on a day she disappeared. His cell phone pinged very close to her home around the time she was last seen. Brad was then named the prime suspect, but he was not arrested. Brad's criminal life began when he was 18 years old. He broke into the apartment of a woman and assaulted her. In 1986, he was sentenced to serve 10 to 15 years in prison. He was released in June of 2000 after serving 14 years, but he was soon in trouble again. He assaulted a female family member and was sentenced to up to 8 years for child abuse. He was paroled in 2007. It was then that he met Krista and I started dating. I also don't know what she saw in him. In 2017, Brad was sentenced to 16 to 40 years in prison for misconduct with a minor and using a computer to commit a crime. In January of 2021, a warrant for Brad's arrest was issued in connection to Krista's case. He is currently an inmate in a Michigan Department of Corrections. It is not known yet if any new information in the case finally led to the arrest. Ingham County District Court Judge Donald Allen said that even though Krista's body has not been found, Brad will have to stand trial. He also said that he watched a video of Brad's first interview with investigators after Krista's disappearance. Not once during the course of that did I see a person who seemed to be disturbed about the disappearance of Krista. Donald Allen also pointed out that Brad did not once try to call Krista after she disappeared. This indicates that he knew she was not going to pick up the phone. It will be difficult to convict Brad, since there is nobody, but not impossible. Prosecutors will have to show how unusual it was for the victim to just disappear. 22-year-old Danny Geiser lived in Pittsburgh, California in 2000. He was a talented young hairdresser and was about to start a new job as a custodian at Pittsburgh Unified School District. Sadly, he would never start his new job. On September 27, 2000, Pittsburgh police received a 911 call. A man had been shot while sitting in his car. The victim was Danny Geiser. He was taken to Sutter Delta Medical Center, where he passed away due to his injuries less than an hour later. The only lead investigators had at the time was that an attacker possibly fled a crime scene in a light-colored Ford Mustang. Investigators have spent the last 20 years looking into numerous persons of interest and suspects. A break in the case finally came in 2019. Investigators identified Paya Tessini as a possible suspect. They have not yet said what led them to him. Investigators secured a search warrant and obtained new evidence in connection to the case. In 2021, investigators believed they had enough evidence to convict Tessini for taking the life of Danny.